Over to you, Susie. Off we go. Well, welcome everybody to our first ever webinar for 2024. I'm very excited to be here with you all. It's our first webinar for the National Association of Enabling Educators Australia, the NIA. So before we get right into it all, we'll just do an acknowledgement of country. So we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to their elders past and present. We extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples here today. So just a little bit about our association before we get started. And if you would like to um, QR code, the, the QR code on the screen, that will take you directly to our website, the NEO website, and you can find out more information about the benefits of membership, which you can see on the screen. But most importantly, of course, it's about the special interest groups, and we've got quite a number of those, which I'll be showing you in the next slide. And those special interest groups, we will be doing a whole presentation at our conference in Darwin on December the 2nd to the 3rd. So there's lots of really exciting things happening in the SIG space. Um, we've got regular updates about the sector and professional development opportunities, and there are also small grants and collaborative research projects happening as well. So being a NEA member has lots and lots of benefits, and I know Trixie and I have found it to be an absolutely amazing experience. So yeah, we encourage you to join. So here are just a few, that there, here are the six, and as you can see, there's quite a number there covering a whole range of different interests. And there, our six are very active, and we're very interested in uh, scholarship of learning and teaching projects, cross institutional research, all sorts of projects are happening. So, you know, we really encourage you to get on board, join NIA, and be part of part of a really dynamic okay. group of people. So, let's get started with our amazing webinar today. Um, just a few protocols. Please keep your mic off if you're not speaking, just so that we don't get any background noise. The presenters would like to do their whole presentation all the way through and then um, have some Q&A at the end. But please feel free to post comments and questions in the chat. And the session is going to be recorded or is being recorded as we speak and will be shared via the NIA website and socials. So if you have a problem with that, let us know. So moving right along, um, our webinar today, as you can see on the screen, is approaches to teaching and engaging students from refugee backgrounds in enabling programs. So we have a few presenters with us from UniSA, and I'm just going to introduce Tamara, and she will introduce the rest of each of the speakers. So um, Tamara, amazing, has over 20 years experience in the field of TESOL, teaching internationally and in Australia. With a keen interest in the study of languages, she's majored in Japanese and a master's degree in applied linguistics in her university education. Tamara works closely with called students and is committed to supporting their language and academic literacy development while fostering learner agency through critical enabling pedagogies. As an academic integrity officer, she has gained extensive experience in leading academic integrity policy and procedures at the University of South Australia. Currently, she is pursuing a PhD, go Tamara, and exploring how cult students' interactions and feedback seeking behaviours with generative AI can enhance their evaluative judgment throughout the writing process. So I'm going to hand over to Tamara and wish everybody an amazing webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Susie, for that really warm introduction. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our uh, webinar today. Um, it's a pleasure to be hosting this webinar and uh, to have us all together to generate conversation about how we can support students who identify as culturally and linguistically diverse. And of course, you know, these students make up a significant proportion of the enabling education student cohort. And there's quite a large representation of students from refugee backgrounds within that group. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure for me to be leading uh, this special interest group together with my colleagues, Snejana and, and Heidi. Um, 
and uh, and we have a real passion for sharing our approaches and practices to support this um, this group of students. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our presenters today who are going to share um, some very exciting findings from their research. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Snezhana Bilik. Um, Snezhana is, or Snez, as we call her, um, is a lecturer at UniSA College here at the University of South Australia. Um, Snez is a lead academic in UniSA College Refugee Student Support Groups and is committed to the provision of support for culturally and linguistically diverse students, in particular for students of refugee backgrounds and their educators at the UniSA College. Snezhana's current research explores teachers' understandings of the cultural dimensions of the lives of students with refugee experience and how this engagement and understanding can be used to further produce positive outcomes for these students. So thank you, Snez. Snez will be presenting first today. And um, she will also be, uh, she uh, conducted her research together with uh, Dr. Heidi Hetz. And unfortunately, Heidi won't uh, be able to be with uh, here presenting today, um, but we do recognise Heidi's work. So following Schnez, uh, we have got Victoria Wilson. Dr. Victoria Wilson, or otherwise known as Tori, uh, is a lecturer in the Pathways at Uni um, SQ College at the University of Southern Queensland. She's been teaching English to speakers of other languages since 2004. And she has a PhD in trauma-informed teaching of English to adult speakers of other languages and has presented widely on this in Australia and in internationally. And she publishes on inclusive adult education. So a big warm welcome to our presenters today. Um, Susie went through all the housekeeping before. Um, so if you could just please keep your microphones muted throughout. Uh, yes, the recording is in process. So we will be sharing the recording link with you after the presentation. I do encourage you um, to ask questions. I will be facilitating a Q&A session after um, our two presenters have done their bit. Um, so if you could please uh, utilise the chat function, um, pop in any questions that come to mind, and um, we can uh, raise these questions to our, our presenters um, at the end. So, um, Shnezana, would you like to kick us off? Excellent. Thanks, Tam. Thank you to Naya, uh, our webinar organisers, and thanks to everyone who um, shares passion in inclusive education for joining us today. Um, as um, uh, Tamara has outlined, I'll be sharing findings from the research that I've conducted with Dr. Heidi Hetz, and Heidi does send her regards and unfortunately is an apology for today. So the research that I'll be uh, exploring is on um, culturally responsive and enabling pedagogical approaches to teaching and engaging students of refugee backgrounds. And um, in the presentation, I'll talk about how we conducted the research, what were the aims of our research, the methods that we've utilised. I'll tell you a little bit about culturally responsive um, as well as enabling pedagogy. I know I'm speaking to the converted here. There are a number of enabling uh, pedagogues in the in the uh, virtual room, but I will talk about how these two um, different but complementing approaches work well in um, uh, further engaging students of refugee backgrounds. I'll share some of the findings from our research and we'll provide some brief recommendations for educators who do engage with students of refugee backgrounds. So I did want to also acknowledge that we have received funding from University of South Australia's Education Futures um, Education Research Academy, and we have had um, significant help from our research assistant, Dr. Dashiell Elaine, who completed the interviews, as well as um, Mr. Jordan Noako, who assisted with participant recruitment. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the numbers, uh, we um, find that at University of South Australia, um, UniSA College, we find that about 20% of our students uh, anecdotally are students of refugee backgrounds. Um, some of you that uh, have done research or have read um, in this area, we find that numbers, you know, um, determining the exact numbers can be a, a bit of a problem because obviously um, of, um, you know, the, the data isn't really available. So the data that we worked for for this project came from the um, humanitarian visa um, holder numbers that we have at UniSA College. And we found that um, 
from 2012 to the start of 2024, we had uh, 340 students who were on humanitarian visas, but we also argued that further insight can be provided by looking at the country of birth of students. So, for instance, in 2022, we had um, a total of 191 students who were either overseas born with many coming from refugee producing countries or countries that have been used as transit countries by refugees. We also acknowledge that students might, some students might be um, refugee-like, as Baker, Sally Baker has outlined in her research. Refugee-like background students means that they may have, students may have experienced forced immigration or li lived in a refugee camp, uh, but have not been ascribed refugee status in Australia. So uh, in terms of what we've aimed to do with our research, we obviously try to really uh, delve quite uh, significantly into um, the experiences of students of refugee backgrounds, given that they are historically an underrepresented group. Um, we argue there's a critical need to develop programs and strategies to support students of refugee backgrounds to participate meaningfully and to achieve meaningful success in their studies, as the current one-size-fits-all model doesn't really work. It's not adequate enough and it does not meet the specific and unique needs of students. We also argue that opportunities, resources and supports that enable ca capability, build confidence and foster belonging must be ava made available to students from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds to build greater equity in higher education. Um, we also recognise that the challenges of students with refugee backgrounds um, that they face in higher education can't be addressed by just providing additional scholarships or other remedial supports. Um, but we need to improve pedagogical approaches. We need to prioritise that. And as Hattam and Wheeler in their forthcoming um, uh, journal ar um, article argue, improving retention is a pedagogical problem. So one response to this challenge is enacting culturally responsive pedagogies. There's a growing body of evidence that culturally responsive pedagogies do improve academic success in super diverse classrooms. So in our research, we've utilised this pedagogical approach. However, there are many culturally responsive pedagogies uh, and in, in our research, we draw on approaches by Gloria Letson Billings and Geneva Gay, and we also utilize the Australian conception by Morrison, Rigney, Hatton, and Diplock. So, cultural responsive pedagogies are the pedagogies that value, mobilize, um, and mobilize as resources the cultural repertoires and intelligences the students bring to the learning relationships. These pedagogies are taken to be intrinsically dialogic and critically conscious, opening up generative and decolonizing possibilities. Um, cultural responsive pedagogies um, rest on a premise that all curriculum and pedagogy are culturally based. We know from our teaching experience that culture has a profound impact on teaching and learning as it strongly influences attitudes, values and behaviours of both students and teachers. And cultural responsive approaches empower students intellectually, socially, emotionally and politically by using cultural reference to impart knowledge, skills and attitudes. Cultural responsive educators set high standards for students. Their teaching is multidimensional as they engage with multiple facets of students' life worlds. They embrace multicultural curriculum. I have highlighted these terms of reference to, to sort of um, just make a connection between cultural responsive pedagogies and enabling pedagogies. You'll find that when I cover enabling pedagogies, many of these terms of reference are also echoed um, in what enabling pedagogues do. So culturally responsive edu um, educators embrace multicultural curricula. They, uh, their teaching embraces social, emotional, political aspects as they seek to provide a holistic learning experience and build learning communities. Their aim for transformation by utilizing a strengths-based approach and their emancipatory aiming for liberation from oppressive educational practices. Enabling pedagogies share many aspects of culturally responsive pedagogies. Enabling pedagogies are found in critical pedagogies, and these include social justice commitment, they are dialogic, they're about democratic participation of students, they are also about transformation and they foster critical consciousness and the development of student voice. Enabling pedagogies are culturally responsive. Enabling pedagogies do work because as um, uh, enabling practitioners, we aim to connect with students' life worlds and our data will show how we've done so. Uh, we foster a sense of belonging where students are cared for, a sense of hope is provided, the curriculum is negotiated. We also set challenging tasks, but we recognise that these must be accompanied by scaffolding and demystifying of the curriculum. Um, essentially, enabling pedagogies are also about a holistic view of success and um, 
uh, what's also central to our research is uh, understanding that critical reflexivity of us as educators is also a requirement uh, for maintaining the capacity to understand, engage uh, with and enable students. So in terms of our research, we have um, interviewed students and staff, students with refugee backgrounds and staff that engage with this cohort of students. We have had individual interviews with students of refugee backgrounds, um, 10 interviews uh, with students who've come from Congo, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Burma and Syria. And we have done a number of focus staff interviews with staff who included tutors, um, leaders who uh, worked with students as peer assisted study supports, uh, peer support officers from the refugee support group, which we have at UniSA College. Uh, we also interviewed uh, five course coordinators who have taught uh, literacy courses and university studies. These are core courses at the UniSA College. And therefore, this staff has had um, quite a lot of interactions with students with refugee backgrounds. So we decided to focus on um, utilizing these perspectives. In terms of the findings, I will talk about the four main themes to sort of show what are some of the best practice approaches for engaging, uh, meaningfully engaging with students with refugee backgrounds. The first theme that I'll talk about is challenging deficit discourses. The second theme is about fostering strong positive teacher-student relationships. Um, I'll make some recommendations on how we can tailor approaches to students with refugee backgrounds, learning needs and sociocultural experiences. And we'll talk about um, how important it is to connect with students' life worlds through uh, uh, showing respect, connecting with their languages, cultures and lived experiences. So in terms of the first finding, we find that uh, our research identified the staff um, um, that was essentially um, talked about a number of challenges with teaching and supporting students of refugee backgrounds in higher education. Uh, this included um, deficit views for this cohort of students across the institution, limited familiarity of students of refugee backgrounds with important skills and knowledge for higher education, as well as their reluctance to uh, seek help. And one of the members of staff outlined this when, when they said, we have these stereotypes and assumptions and labeling a deficit view and it can be very dangerous because I may not be patient with someone who might be a student of refugee background because of this. And this is why we constantly emphasize that it's important for us as educators to critically reflect on our own positionality. It also means recognizing the strength, agency and aspirations of students of refugee backgrounds. But it also means understanding that students of refugee backgrounds, like all students, have multiple identities and being refugees one only one aspect of who they are. They obviously have very rich background as one of our members of staff has identified in the research. Um, second theme, um, uh, in, in the second theme, we find that in line with culturally responsive um, and enabling pedagogies, a number of staff have really prioritized or discussed how important it is to develop strong, positive teacher-student relationships. So one of the members of staff said, we create an environment where do, we do reach out, build that relationship with the students, and it's a very important part of our identity. And this was really valued and appreciated by the students. As Aisha says, I really appreciate that they understand that we're not all from Australia. So I didn't study what the guy next to me studied before. I was studying as well, but not the same. It's very good when educators give me opportunities to ask questions. It's like big support. And Anusha also said, I really... I realized that the staff actually and the, and the teachers listen to us, they understand us. In every week they say, if you have a problem, you can visit us and email us. So the, this notion of support and relationships was really valued by the students. Um, we, the staff have also, um, you know, while we praise the positive relationships, the staff have also outlined a number of challenges. Um, and they identify that, you know, uh, students of refugee backgrounds, like many equity groups in the enabling space, may have not developed important skills and knowledges of higher education, uh, study skills. They know, may not understand university processes like census dates and so on. So the staff has, have spo has pointed out a really important point, which is that as educators, we must make explicit the hidden curriculum. So as one of the members of staff, staff said, it's not just about teaching the content or teaching our discipline. It's also about hidden curriculum. And as another member of staff outlined, 
you know, we, we have hidden curriculum in the classroom, but we also have the hidden curriculum operating externally, making it quite difficult for students of refugee backgrounds to navigate the online space. Um, so we promote uh, uh, creating tailored approaches to support students' learning needs and sociocultural experiences. Uh, one of the first aspects of this tailored approach is to develop academic skills uh, and English language capacities as um, the most common challenges identified by students of refugee backgrounds where developing academic skills, navigating university life, the language barrier, social isolation, juggling university study with other commitments such as work or family and so on. Staff have recognized these challenges and, and the students have showed the appre appreciation for it. Um, as the quote from Bashir on the screen shows, um, he was really appreciative when he said, everyone showed empathy for my challenges as a student of refugee background. But we promote the support should be offered without singling out students of refugee background. Um, and we, we advocate that these, um, these kinds of approaches, uh, um, essentially other equity groups would benefit from, from these approaches. Um, not singling out students of refugee backgrounds was outlined by Hazida, who said, I don't want to be treated differently. If they know I'm a refugee, I don't want them to be like, oh, she's a refugee. We should pay more attention to her. I don't want them. I want them to treat me like other people. But at the same time, it's important that they know ways uh, whereby they can help me. Another um, very important aspect of tailoring approaches to students' learning needs and sociocultural experiences is being trauma-informed, and we'll hear a, a lot more from Victoria in the second presentation on this, but our staff felt that they require training on trauma-informed strategies. There was a real concern that, um, as outlined in the first quote, um, that we don't re-traumatise the students. As a course coordinator outlined um, in our research, how do we as educators, you know, the, the, the challenge is how do we as educators best approach students without re-traumatizing them or potentially causing damage individually? Another member of staff talked about thinking about developing and developing their curriculum in a way that's sensitive to the uh, potential traumatic backgrounds that the students may have had. And the Next theme is uh, connecting with students' life worlds. We know that students bring a range of interesting and exciting experiences with them to the classroom, so we promote that it is important to connect with the students' life worlds, connect with the language, cultures and lived experiences. One way of doing this is to create respectful and inclusive classrooms, as one of the members of staff said, I just want students to feel comfortable because if they're curious and they feel supported, or they feel they belong, that's where the learning happens. And again, students really resonated with this, and Bashir talked about this uh, at, uh, with his experience at the college. He said, for everyone, their culture and their lifestyle is beautiful. Uh, and in that kind of situation, you're really encouraged to talk about yourself and the culture. If you think that the overall atmosphere is positive, it makes you feel like you're at home, you're safe, you're happy, and that people are interested in you and your culture, then the negative thoughts that you're not that you don't have a, a space in society, a place in society, that, that those are all proven wrong. So quite a powerful thought about that uh, importance of sense of belonging there. Um, in terms of connecting with students' life worlds, um, our staff have provided multiple opportunities for students to share their lived experiences, either in classrooms or through assessments. And one of the members of staff uh, outlined this further saying, uh, it's important where you know students will engage if they see the curriculum and the content is interesting that it relates them and draws on their experience and that they have a choice and Bashir again uh, really valued this he's done a digital literacy course where he um, pitched the idea to actually develop a website where he consolidated a number of different pieces of information uh, uh, that uh, people of refugee background may benefit from, and he loved that. He thought that was really exciting, and he said, um, I pitched the idea that I can make the website full of information, and the teacher really liked it. It was a nice experience. Um, part of the um, uh, tailored approach, uh, part of uh, connecting to students' life worlds uh, may, might mean that we encourage uh, multilingualism in the classroom. Um, and this is how we connect with students through their languages um, and, uh, and we get them to use their entire linguistic repertoire. As one of the members of staff said, 
um, in, in her course, students are encouraged to use the entire linguistic repertoire if they need to use any of the language translation, translation tools when they're thinking about activities. Um, they're allowed to do so because it is about that linguistic access, enabling students to use their home languages within the school. And another tutor also talked about how important this is in helping students reduce the cognitive load. If they know a little bit of something or the content in their own language, um, they'll do better. Um, and then they can um, they tend to work on the language side of things later on. Um, and as another member of staff really outlined the strengths based approach where, where she said, I do try to encourage my students to look at themselves as uh, being bilingual or multilingual and that they got this repertoire of languages um, because I think a lot of them have never really thought about it in that capacity. So, you know, uh, building building on the strengths that the students bring is essential. So that leaves me with the recommendations from our research. We argue that uh, in order to enhance meaningful participation of students of refugee backgrounds in higher education and enabling programs, we need to challenge deficit discourses. Uh, about this cohort of students in ourselves and others. We need to acknowledge students' agency, strengths and aspirations, but also um, critically reflect on our own positionality as educators. We also argue that providing tailored approaches will enhance the participation uh, of students of refugee backgrounds, whereby we make explicit uh, teaching of the hidden curriculum, um, tailoring um, approaches to uh, language supports, academic supports, and providing trauma-informed um, uh, approaches. Uh, uh, we find that uh, uh, having uh, strong student-staff relationships really enhances students' engagement, um, and we can do that by sharing our own experiences, either of migration or even talking about our own educational uh, challenges with the students. Uh, connecting with students via popular culture always works, uh, but also listening and asking students about their needs, being proactive and offering supports without singling students out. Another lot of recommendations includes, um, again, that connection with the student life world. This may not mean this does not mean that we need to know about every single culture and every single language, but you know, this this should mean that we have respectful, inclusive classrooms. If we can allow home language in, uh, use uh, in classrooms, allowing students to share about their lives and culture, at least in um, discussions, uh, providing choice in assessments. And I didn't really expand on the next point because it's a it's essentially a presentation in its own. But we also argue that we need to challenge the dominance of Western knowledges and um, you know, we need to invite students to look at an issue or a topic that we are teaching from a different perspective, validating different cultural perspectives. Um, and an e another um, uh, easy one that can be dealt with is making accommodations for um, assignment due dates, for religious or cultural celebrations. This certainly takes into account the complexities that many students do balance uh, when they are studying at university. So that's it from me. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions um, afterwards. Um, thanks for listening. And uh, Victoria, I look forward to hearing your presentation next. Thank you so much, um, Snejana, and thank you so much for inviting me, um, you and Heidi, to um, to present today. Um, the information that follows is very, very similar with um, what what Jana has just said, which is um, which is is really great. Um, so first of all, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of um, the lands where I'm coming from, which is the um, the Yugo peoples, and um, I pay respect to the elders and also the emerging leaders. We've got one with us um, today, who is um, Aaron O'Donoghue, a colleague of mine. All right, so um, to start off, let's um, look at the sources of my information for this presentation today. It was um, mostly based on findings of my PhD, which is in trauma-informed um, teaching of English to adult speakers of other languages. That They were um, students from three universities in Queensland, the English language programs there. Um, there was a mixture of um, nationalities and backgrounds. Um, there were international students and students from refugee background and immigrant students, but um, there were no significant differences. And um, the findings of the PhD um, really reinforced um, 
everything that I have um, learned um, in the classroom, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we use the cross-culturally validated post-traumatic stress um, screening tool and semi-structured interviews with the questions being based on students' experiences of learning English here um, and are based around trauma-informed uh, principles of trauma-informed practice and critical pedagogies. Um, and you can you can see publications um, at my website. Uh, the other sources were um, 10 years of working with um, students from refugee backgrounds here at Uni um, SQ um, and, and beyond there, um, a lot of listening to these students on their experiences of learning what works, what doesn't work, trying things in the classroom um, when uh, and, and some things work, some things didn't. Um, also, I was diagnosed with PTSD about 10, 10 plus years ago because um, I was living in coastal Fukushima um, at the time of the 2011 disasters when 18,000 people were killed um, in the one day. Um, I've also done joint research collaborations with students from refugee backgrounds as co-authors and um, a lot of PD. Um, we have a lot of brilliant scholars in um, this area in Australia, um, some with refugee backgrounds themselves. Um, and as we can see from the overlap between this presentation and the last one, um, the, it, it's all coming up with very similar findings. So that is um, reassuring. Um, all right, so some basics about post-traumatic stress disorder. The worldwide rate is about 8%. Of course, not all trauma survivors experience PTSD, and in fact, most do not. Um, and often people from a refugee back background have very strong religious faith, family connections that can act as a protective effect. So we can't um, really predict who or, or try to diagnose who has PTSD in our classroom. Just expect that there probably is some post-traumatic stress in the classroom. Teach everybody in this way and everybody will benefit. Um, something becomes post-traumatic stress disorder when the effects are prolonged and they cause a problem with everyday living and um, can cause uh, distress. Um, it is a cross-culturally valid concept and also across time. It's not referring to just normative grief responses. Um, and of course, when you're still in the traumatic um, environment, um, well, that's not that's not PTSD, um, that's ongoing trauma. Um, it doesn't mean the normative grief responses um, to that. But if you're in an objectively safe environment and you're still um, your body and brain still feels like it's in that Sorry, can you go back a bit? <laughs> it still feels like it's in the um, traumatic um, zone, then that is extremely, um, that that is PTSD. Sorry, I'm getting all these messages from Teams coming up, which is just a bit distracting. Um, I think it's from the chat. It's coming through my USQ Teams. <laughs> um, okay, so from a medical point of view, um, PTSD responses include uh, intrusive re-experiencing of the trauma. So that's like a flashback. The body and brain feels like it's going through it again. Um, avoidance of trauma-related stimuli. Um, so if somebody brings up even words, images um, to do with that trauma, it can feel like you're in that trauma again. Um, going through it, the flashbacks again and the release of all the stress hormones and the amygdala hijack. Um, negative cognitions and moods, so um, depression and um, anger, self-blame, guilt, hypervigilance, um, feeling that things aren't real or that you, you're numb, you're outside your own body. And, of course, there are many barriers to um, to mental health care um, for all of us, but especially for refugee background students. Um, so we can't just say, well, go to the psychiatrist and come back when you're ready. It doesn't work like that. Also, um, the learning environment is really, really important. It's important to know, though, that PTSD is not a learning disability. A traumatized person is not broken. Um, they just need a, a, a the right environment that's going to um, going to facilitate learning. So as I said, when um, the post-traumatic stress responses are activated, um, the brain and body go on high alert and also gives um, a greater sensitivity to stress. So to um, the casual outsider, they might think, well, why are they getting upset about that? But it's just because their body is is, is 
just on this hyper alert um, all the time. Um, and also greater sensitivity to signs of acceptance and rejection um, with the nonverbals. Um, ultimately, it comes down to a person in a state that fear cannot learn. Um, so we want people feeling like they um, are in a safe environment. Um, also, PTSD, it can cause some verbal um, processing um, problems, trouble with engagement, focus, memory, cognition, organising material, um, and so on. So we don't want um, people to be in that state of alarm so that they are not having those, um, those difficulties. Um, so it's not just um, something for psychologists and psychiatrists to deal with. It, it needs to be a multi-pronged approach. Um, Post-traumatic stress responses are fluid as well. Um, it's not like you, they're on all the time, but they can be um, worsened or improved by the social environment, including the teaching environment. And so this social environment is, is really crucial. Um, on the, at the psychosocial level, um, oh, sorry, next one. At the psychosocial level, um, oh, sorry, next one. I'm behind. Yep. No, next next one. No, there we are. Okay. Um, um, trauma and immigration, um, especially involuntary immigration, can shatter um, person's trust, um, their worldview. Is the world um, a safe and um, benign place or is it total chaos? Um, actual safety and the sense of safety, meaning, what's the meaning? Is there any meaning to anything? It, why should I go on? Connections, because families and communities have been separated and this feeling of numbness and not being able to, um, to connect with, with people. Really, um, it comes down to, to this question here, am I safe and do I matter? And I'll say that again. Um, am I safe and do I matter? Because it's, it's just such a useful um, lens for, for looking at this. Okay, so some principles, some key principles that are already, already established in trauma-informed pra trauma practice and um, critical pedagogies, which I found really interesting, and that also um, um, overlaps with what Snezhana was saying to us. So the first one, safety and security. Um, it's it's a really massive one. Um, also, as uh, as Jana said, having agency, having meaningful choices, um, having the students' identities foregrounded. Again, I'm I'm covering a lot of similar ground here to Jana, but it's from a different perspective. So, um, it's good to see that they overlap there. Um, acknowledgement of their strengths and building on the strengths that they already have. Um, a sense of belonging, um, so being truly seen and truly heard, not just lip service to that. And the last one is meaning um, and doing meaningful things and having some meaning is really important for for um, for recovery from, from trauma. So now I want to talk about a few key findings and look at the whys and the hows and the effects of this. And this is self-reported effects, self-reported effects by students. Um, so how are we going for time? Sorry, uh, you probably got about another five to ten minutes. Oh yeah, no worries. Okay, so um, the this, okay, so the first one, valuing of cultural identities, and we heard from Jana um, in, in brilliant um, detail about why that's so important and how to do that, so um, a lot of this is covering similar ground. Um, First of all, why is it so important? A person's cultural or religious or ethnic identity can and often is the source of existential threat. And by that, I mean they have been targeted, killed, um, you know, genocides have been enacted on people because of their religion, because of their culture, because of what they look like. So it's it's the identity, the group identity is really complicated because on one hand, it, it provides a lot of sense of pride, belonging, comfort, um, and a way of understanding the world. But the, on the other hand, people have literally um, killed them because of it or, you know, killed killed their, um, their members of the community. And a lot of our students have just come out of, of these genocidal situations. Um, recently, we have a lot of Azidi students in um, Toowoomba who have literally come out of that. 
Um, so to show somebody that you value their group identity, their culture, their religion, their, their the way they look, um, it's it's unconsciously providing their brain with safety and their they're, they're told you are safe here and that allows them to learn. Also, as Jana said, the familiar content that comes with cultural content provides the entry point and the way to engage with the learning materials. People in general, not just traumatized people, we can't handle too much novelty at once. Um, so it, we tend to go into fight or flight if there's too much and too new. Um, but if and and also as Jana said, when if you're learning a language and you're learning new concepts, that can be um, that's a lot to process. So if at least so the concepts, some of the concepts are familiar, then the cognitive load is is not so high, and it's it's a much better way to to um, enter that that new um, the new new topics and information. So how do we do this? Um, as Jana also said, the relevant culturally responsive syllabus. Um, the students in my study said that they were really motivated by cultural pride, sharing their own culture, but also curiosity about other people's culture, really wanted to know what they did, what they thought, and so on. And this gave them strong motivation to communicate and connect um, with their peers. Um, so as Jana also said, the sharing, be, being able to share their own cultural knowledge and apply um, their, their knowledge to a cross-cultural comparison really helps with understanding and engagement. And by the way, students from refugee backgrounds really are the best at critical thinking because they've had, got this, um, they've experienced different life in different cultures and um, thinking in different languages that really uh, I don't know the science behind it, but I think it must really expand the, the brain in, in some really meaningful ways. Um, but we should, of course, make it strengths based and um, not be talking about the deficits or um, the traumas of of um, of cultures in in these enabling courses. Of course, if it's a, if it's a course on literature or um, history, then that's different, but um, we have to think about what the end goal is um, for that. Um, all this can lead to um, engagement with better engagement, enhanced understanding course materials, collaboration, um, bit feeling of being accepted and understanding others, and actually a transformative learning experience is what people reported. Um, next one, please. So the next one is teacher engagement, attunement to students. Jana also spoke about this. It's really important from a trauma point of view because um, refugees have often lost so much family, community, their culture because of the events and the refugee process. Um, and all humans have a very strong need to feel seen and heard and valued that do I matter? We need this for survival. It's hardwired in our brains. And uh, refugee students are usually from collectivist cultures and this Western individualist atomized do everything alone and by yourself can be very alienating and source of culture shock. Um, how do we do this? Well, really, ideally, we need small classes and as much face-to-face -face learning and support as possible. It's not good enough to just say, there's a website, go, here's a link. Um, Self-teaching courses, uh, I know we're all, most of us are working in stressed conditions where we're forced to go online as much as possible, but it's not going to be the best. Um, teachers should be fully invested in communicative encounters. So instead of, oh, sorry, I don't know what you're saying and move on, take a bit of time to negotiate that meaning and understand it so that they're understood and you're understood. Um, of also, as Jana said, recognize their identity is multilingual. But um, part of that is that they, they're multilingual and an English language learner. So we need to communicate more clearly um, for example, um, don't use lots of idioms and metaphors, um, slang, organize the material well, speak clearly, um, use easier words. That's going to help everybody. Of course, treat as people and not just numbers. Um, they're very um, attuned to how they are treated and this really does affect learning. Because of culture and trauma, um, we need to provide preemptive support. Um, rather than just waiting for everybody to come to us. It's it's not that simple. Um, 
also when teachers are really engaged to the students and the tune then we are able to tell um, what their academic needs are their cultural needs even personal needs by being very attentive to what's not said the non-verbals um, then um, those things happen and Jana also mentioned that um, some effects trust connection safety belonging and again learning and the next slide please so the next one is about sharing power and avoiding hierarchy. It's really important to be egalitarian and to build autonomy um, through scaffolding. So students from refugee backgrounds have usually experienced a lot of injustice, um, persecution, arbitrary punishment, um, and a severe lack of power being demonized, um, not believed. So we need to first of all we need to ensure that students are in the correct level in terms of their where they are in their learning so that they're similar to their peers in the english language proficiency that reduces a lot of the fear um, don't single out one culture or pre for praise or approbation of course value everybody's contribution equally um, the teachers should be calm and predictable very consistent reliable and trustworthy um, students get very rattled um, when they feel like a, a teacher can't be trusted or is um is unpredictable um be transparent and consistent in all those decisions um or offer choices in assessments a couple of topics and of course treat as as free adults and um unfortunately occasionally you know you do you do hear about um, students being yelled at and treated like kids and um, it, it really does not help at all. Um, if we have a power sharing and egalitarian classroom or a learning environment, there is a sense of fairness, justice, um, a feeling that we're, we're the same, we're in it together and that gives a lot of motivation, um, ability to connect with um, peers and safety, belonging and learning. And my last slide is interactive collaborative learning. So Jeanne also talked about this. Trauma um, is about powerlessness, being silenced, being disbelieved, not having a voice. So um, students also, um, it's that they, they, we learn by doing rather than that um, banking method of here is the information and you will absorb it. Um, it's it's much better to be doing something. Also, the isolation of learning alone can cause a lot of um, distress. So how do we do this? As Jana also said, dialogic teaching, a lot of pair work, small group work. It's best if that can be shared problem solving in, and info gap activities. Um, not just the discuss and report, discuss in a group and report back. I know I'm guilty of that sometimes, but it can be boring for students and it can fall flat a lot of the time um, where we can put a bit more um, thought into the, the lesson um, plan for that. Um, it also creates emotional safety um, to enable collaborative work. So as I talked about in the previous slides, when they can, when it's about culture and, and so on. Um, and I think students from refugee background, in my experience um, of teaching in TP tertiary prep classes, um, they are the best at this because they've gone through English as a second language pedagogy and they're used to speaking and collaborating and they're not scared to, to speak up, unlike um, a lot of our Aussie students who <laughs> can be quite inhibited. Um, and the, this is reported to um, lead to a sense of acceptance, safety and belonging, um, connection with the teacher and with their peers, also under, more understanding of the peers and the course materials and um, synergistic knowledge creation, again, leading to learning. Um, so I know I have gone through this um, at a pretty big speed, um, but if you want more information resources, I have got a, um, a website there, Human Informed TESOL. You can also enter via traumainformedtesol.com. Um, my email address, if you can see that, I've got a LinkedIn group. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got, you can join me on LinkedIn, and I've also got a special interest group on LinkedIn. If you'd like to join that, you are most welcome. Um, thank you so much. And um, we've got time for questions for me and Jana. Thank you. Thank you, Tori. Thank you, Schnez. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you for sharing those insights from your research. Um, we had a, a couple of questions and comments that came through on the chat, um, which I might just uh, see if I can put to the two of you and um, see if we can generate a bit of a conversation around this. Um, Snezh, the first one's for you. Um, it's in regards to uh, the 
the slide that you were talking about building um, positive student teacher relationships. Um, Roz makes the comment um, that this can sometimes be challenging when universities tend to rely upon sessional and casual staff all the time and students are seeing a different face every semester. Um, so I was just wondering if perhaps you might have a suggestion or um, or would like to comment on that, how, how we might approach that with that sort of building that inclusive um, education approach when when the teachers tend to change. Thanks for that question. Very, uh, very um, important question because, you know, we are talking about resources and I know some of what I promoted seems to be quite idealistic of let's just, you know, support and 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 everyone's going to live um, happily ever after. Um, I'm happy to be able to provide an example of where what we've done in terms of providing professional development for our sessional staff. Uh, we are lucky again um, at the UniSA College, we do have professional development uh, workshops for sessional staff where uh, we talk about enabling pedagogies as inclusive pedagogies. And then um, I was privileged enough to be invited to also talk about, um, you know, dealing with culturally and linguistically diverse students. If um, resources are scarce as they are, mm. uh, providing some sort of a hub where you have, um, you know, resources on what does it mean to have an inclusive classroom uh, that's, you know, sessional staff that is new can quickly revisit and then just provide examples of, you know, how do we do this well, as I've said, with recommendations, um, you know, share some of your own experience. If you show students that you are only human, they really appreciate that. And then as to, that connects with what Tori was saying, you know, we talk about trauma-informed approaches with um, when teaching students of refugee backgrounds. But I've experienced, you know, I've I've met many students who have dealt with trauma that are not a refugee background. So having those inclusive classrooms uh, is central. And and my yeah advice would be to have some sort of a, either an online central hub where you have the information. We are happy to obviously share all the resources to um, any institution mm -hmm. that feels that these are valuable. Uh, but it would be, I mean, we we've been lucky with our leadership team where we could make. Um, arguments for additional professional development resources and, and those have been taken on board. So either talking to the leadership team or, or, or making sure that some resources are available online. Yeah, great. Thanks, Shnez. Um, Thanks. Yeah, that, that professional development is, is so important, isn't it? Shnez, um, there was another comment. You, you talked about the hidden curriculum. We actually did have another audience member that um, attempted to answer that. What, what is the Karen. hidden curriculum? Yeah, I was wondering, would you like to add to that? No, I thought that was brilliant. Thanks, Kieran. I really appreciated that. But it is essentially, sorry, every now, I'm a sociologist and, you know, I talk about making um, content explicit and then I provide very complex terminology. Apologies for that. It is essentially aspects of the curriculum that are implicit. So, for instance, you know, students sometimes don't even know how to find the classroom when they come to university. Uh, they don't know where to enroll. They don't know where to submit the assignment. They don't know where, you know, as I've said, you know, when is the next census date? Um, you know, what does writing an essay mean? Does that mean that you need to have three sections of, a, of a, you know, including an introduction, a body and a conclusion? So just, you know, sort of taking a step back in terms of, you know, what you're teaching and thinking about, does this make sense? Um, and, you know, have I provided as much information as possible to make the information explicit? Thank you, Shnez. That was a, a really great definition. Thank you. And thank you to Kieran as well for, for helping us out there. Um, Tori, thank you mm -hmm. so much for sharing all of your information about PTSD um, informed pedagogy. I think mm -hmm. a lot of us learnt quite a fair bit from your presentation. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question for you as a, um, as a language teacher and mm. um, I find um, that it, I completely agree with you. Everything that you said about we we need to look towards um, a culturally responsive pedagogy, um, having content within the curriculum that students can connect with and feel comfortable with and to stimulate that curiosity and get students to uh, to share um, based upon their own funds of knowledge and, and mm, sharing their, mm. you know, their own epistemologies. Mm -hmm. I have a question though, in regards to sharing content or um, 
having having a theme um, which might somewhat inadvertently, from the teacher's point, yep. trigger some yep. PTSD responses from yeah. the students. And I, yeah. I find I, I, I'm in sort of I have two sort of responses in the in the students, in particularly the students from refugee backgrounds in my class. Um, some are very, very willing and, and yeah. have this real desire to yeah. share their stories, no matter yeah. how traumatic they are, they want to share their stories. Yeah. Whereas others might not be, yeah. but they they don't really tell me yeah. that they're comfortable not to share. And I and yeah. I wonder sometimes if I am crossing the line yeah. when I'm trying to be culturally responsive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um so yeah, I was just wondering, do you have any advice yeah. there as to how Absolutely. I can approach that? Absolutely. Look, the first thing is that there you can't you can't avoid it sometimes you you're just going to remind somebody of something um so for example I naively when I was teaching my first group of Azidi students I we were doing past tense this was in an English class and I said like you know what were you doing in 2021 what were you doing in 2014 2014 oh yes teacher I remember that very well because that's when Islamic State came and kidnapped us God. So, you know, big faux pas. Um, st- if st- students often, as you say, will want to bring up some experiences, and if they want to do that, then that is absolutely their, um, they should be allowed to do that, um, and it's their agency. It's more the fact that um, if you, if your lesson um, is, is, is on something that is obviously traumatic. Like in the English language teaching space, a lot of our textbooks have dis- have a unit on disasters or about risk, life threatening incidences. So that is, and some used to have a thing about refugee experiences. That was that was really bad because could you imagine you're going into a class to learn English or you know tertiary skills, and you're confronted. W- with something that explicitly reminds you of the worst thing you've ever been through in your life that you're supposed to be learning through. So it's more of the, this is what, ha- yeah, it's more about th- carefully thinking about what thematic content to um, bring it in, to to um, to teach through and um, making sure that that is not going to be something that's obviously traumatising, but it can't be helped that sometimes something is going to um, maybe activate post-traumatic stress responses, but certainly give people space to talk about these things if they want to, because some people have been through the most horrific traumas and they don't have PTSD because, well, that's a whole other situation. But yeah, if they want to talk about it, that's a different thing. But don't write it into the lessons. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you, Tori. That's really, really important. I think sort of that reflexive teaching practice really comes into it as well, Mm, doesn't it? mm -hmm, Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I think we've got uh, time for just one more question. Uh, Susie actually posted this in the chat. Um, She says, I love your intercultural group suggestions where students discuss an issue from multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. Do you perhaps have an example of this to show or to share with us? And we've also got a feedback. Was that for me or for for Jana or both of us probably? I'm not sure. Uh, Susie, do you know who that was referring to? I think it was. I think it was Jana. Yeah, first. Yep. Shazana. Yep. Shazana. Yeah. Thank you. Um, So uh, one of the examples that we, I mean, again, I'm lucky to be teaching social sciences. So uh, in terms of this um, intercultural communication, we have uh, students writing journals. Um, And again, this relates to what um, Tamara and Tori have just discussed, uh, where, you know, we talk about human rights, uh, but our case study is um, looking at refugees. Um, And this opens up venues for students who may be of refugee backgrounds to disclose um, that they may be um, uh, refugees, but this is where um, they also start, um, you know, discussing these, their examples, um and and they start sort of you know reflecting on um their own experience in a new multicultural multiculturally diverse host society um so that's one piece of assessment that i felt was really beneficial 
In terms of the language, I find that with many of my students, uh, you know, when they're preparing sociological concepts, I've just recently had a Syrian student who listens to a lot of YouTube in Arabic to actually explain what sociology is. Um, which was slightly disheartening because I felt I was expressing it as clearly as possible, but it is that sort of notion of allowing, you know, use any any avenues you possibly can to make the content as, um, you know, familiar um, as possible, and then and then work on um, then work on the language side of things and so on. I'm happy to address this further via an email. I, I've got a feeling we're running out of time. I can see the. Yeah, we might, we might do that. Thanks, Shnez. Thank you Cheers. so much. We, we will share all of this uh, with the audience as well. I might just quickly hand it back over to Susie and to Trixie because um, there is a little notification about the next SIG webinar mm -hmm. and um, and also uh, the survey feedback form. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, ladies. And look, a huge thank you, Tamara, for um, overseeing this webinar and for Tori and Shnez and even Heidi, who's not here. A huge thank you for stepping up and being... Um, our first webinar for this 2024. Um, as the, the screen that I just had on just previously just highlights the next webinar that we will be hosting. It's on the 14th of June from one o'clock and this is the Mental Health SIG. So they're going to share more around um, how, to, how, how we can best support students. What does student support mean? What does it look like? And uh, how can we even help educators in understanding that? Mm -hmm. um, and then we do have a survey that we would love you to fill out. I've got the QR code. Hopefully this one works. Um, and then what I will be doing It does is, work. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> what I will be doing is sending out the recording, putting it up on our website, actually, the website, the PowerPoint slides, and um, and I'll be sending out this survey to people so that we can get some feedback on how, how you found this webinar. Um, but, yes, thank you so much to everyone for attending today. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week. See ya. Bye. Bye.